Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new podcast series. My name is Patrick Tian. I'm a licensed clinical therapist specializing in childhood trauma. In what this podcast series will be focusing on, we're going to be focusing on people's individual's expressive stories, getting to the heart of the matter that what happened to us in our childhood. We're also going to be omitting a lot of clinical jargon and just focusing on the story, not the diagnosis. And lastly, we'll also be focusing on the Relationship Recovery Program, which is the model of therapy that I practice, also known as RRP. So let's get into this episode. So why not, with the first podcast episode, tell the story of how I actually landed in therapy by some miracle around the most turbulent time in my life? And that time period can actually be told through the longest possession that I've had in my life, which is my 1960s Kohler & Campbell upright spinet piano. A spinet piano is the littlest piano. It's the little piano that could. These are pianos that you see in like an old lady's living room, back rooms and churches for choir rehearsals. And it's, it's, they're just really almost just like a little domestic piano. Um, I'm 45 years old and I've had the piano in my life the whole time, aside from these very turbulent two months in my life. And I'm starting to feel like it's just one, one long transitional object for me. What I love about the piano is the color. I've always been drawn to this piano. It's this reddish mahogany kind of red wine color, and it's got some brass hardware here and there for some bling around the legs and the pulleys where you close up the piano. And it's also got these antique casters, these wheels that you would wheel like a, like a bureau, upright bureau around. And when you look at these little wheels, you're like, how have these things like stood this length of time under all that weight? They're like the also the little pulleys that could. So this piano is just really like, um, it's like an underdog for me. And uh, there's a matching bench with the same kind of brass bling around it. I think my mother crocheted the top to this bench, this like kind of 70s, it had a black background crocheted floral bouquet thing. Um, And I might be making that up and the crocheted cover to the bench might have came with the piano, but not everything is crystal clear in our memory system and in our family life. Some things are crystal clear though. And the idea of my mother actually crocheting this bench cover when we got the piano kind of saddens me because she would have done so of having three children and being able to pull that off, all that crocheting, and it meant to me that you know that she would have been more functioning rather than sort of the hardcore alcoholic that she would sort of progressively become through my childhood. The piano came into my life and in my family of five at the time when I think my, I know, no, I know my aunt, my father's sister, um, they're both Irish immigrants, they came to the country. My aunt came to the US first and then she established a family here, somehow acquired the piano and then I believe sold it to my father or my father might have wanted it in a move. Or it was actually that my aunt moved. They actually lived in the same area in Dorchester, Massachusetts, when my aunt bought a new house, and then my father may just have inherited. Um, So what I'm trying to say is that how we got the piano, the details are not super clear. But um, I was born in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and at the time we lived in one of those famous Boston triple decas, and that's where the piano resided first. Um, and this would have been all around the mid 70s when the piano came into our life. And I can't really imagine my father wanting the piano. It might have been more that my mother said like, oh, let's get that piano. Because my father, if, if it, you know, my father wasn't forward thinking about getting something like that for his children. Um, he didn't really think like that. If it wasn't for him, he wasn't interested in it. And so maybe my mother got the piano in some, in some way. So, however, some kind of exchange happened uh, and in around 1978 when I was one and we were moving from the triple deca um, in Dorchester to, we moved south a few miles away to a town called Quincy, Massachusetts, which is still the town that I consider my hometown. 
And it's funny, and in researching the Kohler and Campbell's company for this podcast, for this story, my aunt bought the piano in Boston. And that the piano was most likely born in the Kohler and Campbell Company factory in Granite Falls, North Carolina, in the early 60s. And for about 60 years, it stayed in the Boston area until I moved down here to Asheville in 2021. So the piano has made a full circle journey as Asheville, North Carolina is only an hour's drive from Granite Falls. And researching this to do this podcast, that little thing kind of blew my mind about the story of how this piano has kind of moved around. I collect musical instruments. I believe that they have a soul. I believe that things, you know, antiques, musical instrument, anything really has a story and a life to it. Um, Or the, the musical instrument has witnessed, in this case, this piano has witnessed the downfall of my family and then my recovery and then where my current family is now, my little nuclear family that I've created. And I've moved this piano around 15 times throughout the Boston area before moving down here in my early 20s, bouncing from apartment to apartment. It got me through an undergraduate degree in music from UMass Boston. I minored in psych. And it was there when I moved in with my special girlfriend at the time, who later became my wife. And it was there doing my years of... I played in bands, and I've written some important songs to me on the piano. I've composed on it in undergraduate. And I was sitting at that piano when I heard myself on the radio for the first time. Back in the day in Boston, I played drums in bands. And on Sunday nights, I'm going to sound like Abe Simpson here. On Sunday nights, they used to play the local music. Um, And I was sitting at that piano. And this was a big moment of really recognizing how traumatized I was. Because the band that I was in, we put out an EP. And that, we put out the EP. We sent it to local radio stations, to like five or six of them. And each one of those stations played a different cut because they liked the EP so much. That was like a big win for us as a band. And I remember on the phone with a girlfriend at the time and just not feeling any of the joy and just reporting that kind of matter of fact. And it was the first time that someone was like, maybe you should go talk to somebody. So it was a little bit of a, of a clue. And again, that's right around this, this turbulent time in my life. So there's so much of my timeline in that piano. But I almost lost the piano during that time in my life which I guess is sort of that almost losing it, kind of it's like the apex of the childhood trauma where it was around the age of 19 years old where I almost lost that piano when my mother's house got foreclosed upon and how my mother behaved around the whole thing was really just sort of like this awakening of just really realizing for the first time in my life about how truly bad things were in my family of origin. And what I mean by like an apex to our childhood trauma story or like a rupture is those moments like say you're in your 30s and you truly see how abusive your mom is from how she behaves at your wedding. Or you might have seen it when you were in high school and there might have been a sexual assault and how the family responded to you. You might have seen it just in having children of your own and you really realize how unsafe one of your parents are around your own kids. It's just these surreal experiences, these existential kind of crisis where there is a small part of us that I think really, we don't pay attention to it enough. There's a small part of us that knows if you're growing up in childhood trauma, how truly bad it is, but that part is so tiny. Um, And when in these moments, these ruptures, it's like a little bit like it's validating that there is a part of you that is always known. And now it's kind of undeniable, like the wheels have come off the bus and let's just go right into the story where the wheels came off the bus and my own family focused around almost losing this piano. So um, in early fall 1996, about a month or so after I left home, I found myself really on the secret mission to to steal this piano back from somebody. And I say this (laughs) stolen in a humorous way because it actually really wasn't stolen. The year prior in 1995, my father died after having cancer, in and out of cancer, for about 10 years. And around that period, graduated high school in 95, was living at home as a waiter in 96, struggling because it's where, after my father passed away, my mother's alcoholism really progressed to a horrific level where her behavior was really off the charts, unsafe. And to my sibling and I, it was just slowly and slowly becoming more and more clear 
that things weren't safe. On top of that, the the house that we were living in, the, my, my parents' home, was becoming foreclosed upon. So there was a clock ticking. Um, my mother was con- incredibly unhinged, and it was just sort of a really bad time. I was 19 years old, and I was really living in, in sort of a ragey trigger state, and it just came down to that my family just kind of, you know, dis- dissipated. You know, my sibling and I moved out. My mother went her own way. The house was lost. And the belongings in the house where I don't even know if we discussed it, what would happen to all this stuff. But somewhere down the line is I had voiced that, you know, I'm going to come back for that piano somehow. Don't give it, don't give it away. Don't sell it or whatever. And in the rare phone calls, I think, you know, where I don't even know where my mother was living at the time, but somehow we, uh, we, we conversed somehow over phone. And um, I had told her that I had saved up enough money to, this is maybe a month or two after I moved out, um, saved up enough money to get the piano. And she said it was gone, that the person who she let's take all the belongings out of the house because there was no room for them kind of like an estate person who would just do clear outs and that kind of thing and i always associate the word estate with something fancy <laughs> but this was essentially just sort of getting out the ratty smoke you know riddled sort of furniture my parents my mom was a smoker clearing out all that stuff and maybe selling it at like a flea market we grew up in poverty and really poor money management hence the foreclosure on the house it came down to I had my mother on my phone and she was just sort of saying the estate planner lied to her and took the piano and she didn't know what to say to me and I was just devastated because I was very much attached to that piano um, which is the whole point of this story and I remember I somehow got the estate planner's number called them was really ragey I'm a 19 year old ragey fighty traumatized you know young man and I was just shocked when this person was just like, yeah, well, well, whatever. I don't, I don't know about all that, but you can come down to and pick up the piano whenever you like. You know, I'll leave the place open. It was a shock to me because I was really expecting the way my mother had couched this story that this was the evil doer who stole the family piano. <laughs> um, when that very much sort of wasn't the case. I was working as a waiter. I didn't really have a lot of money, and I didn't really know how things worked. I didn't even know, like, who do you call to move a piano? Um, And somehow, I don't remember, you know, just maybe I asked somebody, you know, or, you know, this is really pre-internet back in the day, phone book kind of a thing. And I called a piano mover, scheduled a date, and I didn't didn't really know how it was going to go. And um, everything was sort of lined up. But... What was weird about it is I was so adrenalized throughout this whole period because, A, I think when you're 19, you really don't know how things work. And I had, I didn't have a car. I moved from Quincy to in the kind of like a, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston, where I was experiencing a, a lot more. It was actually the best place for me. Um, and... I scheduled the piano movers. And I think at that time, I like to describe myself as feral. Because I think a more forward-thinking person or a less traumatized person would have said uh, or would have maybe asked the movers for a ride to go with them. But what I did is schedule the movers and then in a very anxious state, I took public transportation, um, which was sort of like maybe an hour and a half of uh, the red line in Boston from Cambridge down to Quincy, then I grabbed a bus all the way from Quincy to Weymouth, Massachusetts on Route 3A, which is where this estate planner's kind of um, shop was, and that's where I grew up. And if for those who are not familiar, Route 3A in the 90s is really just, I'm sure it looks better now, but it was just really a lot of just sad strip malls, Chinese food restaurants, maybe some pizza places, lots of bars that I was very familiar with because growing up in an alcoholic family, I can name two or three bars around that strip that um, we spent most of our childhood in waiting for our mother to sort of be done so that we could maybe go home. So that's where I spent most of my time. So getting the bus down there and then waiting for the movers, and I just remember being so just sort of shaken about 
Um, I was in a trauma response and I didn't know how the whole thing was going to go. I didn't know if the rug would be pulled from under me and the guy wouldn't have opened up the door and, you know, and I wouldn't be able to sort of get the piano or the movers wouldn't show up. But what was funny about the whole thing and many things in my life afterward is how streamlined the whole thing was. I got down there in public transportation. They showed up. They were able to get the piano and I was just sort of shocked that it was going so well and then i didn't still didn't have the wherewithal to ask to ride back with them all the way from you know it's probably like a like a 45 minute hour ride and then i hop back on a bus and then i'm anxious again to try to beat the piano movers back um and maybe there the story seems anticlimactic but to me at the time being 19 years old in the, my my body being so traumatized is still I was in sort of shock that it, that it, I pulled it off because there I found myself in my apartment that I a friend had sort of invited me into a three bedroom sharing situation I didn't even know how to write a rent check I was so young and I had just been coming from this family system that was just so dysfunctional that there's so many places that it could have gone so much worse. But at the end of that day, I found myself in my bedroom in, in the, the, another triple-decker in Cambridge. Um, and I was sort of safe, and I was sitting at this piano. And I, it, it was just sort of kind of a, an unbelievable experience. And coming back to this estate planner is to try to understand who my mom was or try to understand a bit about the trauma. My mother's an alcoholic. Uh, she probably has a lot of character logical problems. Not probably, she does. I lived with her for about 20 years. And where this moment was pivotal is when I called her to say, to try to arrange to pick up that piano. And then the estate planner who was just really easy breezy about the whole thing because my mother portrayed this man as like a thief and a crook. And I realized that the reality had caught up with me and I even knew back then is that, you know, it's not that the state planner had stolen the piano and he just took an opportunity to take the thing. No one steals pianos, by the way. <laughs> They're not like, oh, let me, let me swipe this piano. Um, is my mother being an alcoholic and like in many different places in my life, she never communicated with him. Um, what were the specifics around and she at that time period she was drunk every day but it was a funny thing as a childhood trauma survivor is like where when you're still coming out of the teenage years it's a lot like your parents still have a lot of power over reality so what I'm trying to say is I believed her about the estate planner stealing the piano but at that moment when I realized that how easy breezy the estate planner was I think he was just like, wow, these people are high drama. I don't know, this kid's ragey about the piano. I don't get it, you know? And that's really probably what happened. And that was the, the awakening, was really realizing that any time, and I knew this for so many years, it's just you don't really know it until it kind of slaps you in the face, is that, you know, any time that my mother was in trouble, she would just lie. And... When we have a parent that is really betraying the reality, they're also betraying you. And this is just like one small little sort of story. And at that point in my life, my mother had been doing that for many, many years. And um, that is sort of the big kind of awakening that I had focused on as I had really realized that around that time period that my mother, I learned later as, 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 you know, after I had gotten my master's in social work and working in inpatient psychiatry, and you would do an, um, something called a mental static exam on or a biopsychosocial on every new, um, every new patient that came into the hospital. And they would use this phrase that has always stuck with me because I really, you know, kind of thought about, I would often think about my mother. They would say like, you would read someone's chart and the person either whether going through psychosis or drug abuse or whatever that the clinician might write down the person is not a reliable historian and i've always thought about that phrase because it's really the most perfect descriptor of my mother and even to this day where you know and i don't seem to i've done a lot of work on myself i've I'm, i consider myself a very happy and healthy person i don't i don't toss and turn at night about what my mother did to me i'm just explaining this story as sort of like a teaching moment 
And but to this day, if you ask my mother about <laughs> about the piano all, and maybe you relate to this, and maybe you have a parent like this, that all my mother would say would just be like, well, those were really hard times on me. And that's sort of really another way to make it about herself and really betray the, you know, the kind of reality around her. And it's funny, when, we're, when we, we were raised by toxic parents and abusive parents, I often think about this, is that I really think that if my mother were to admit fault, I really think in some way she thinks she's going to die by admitting fault, but it would be the most healing, healing thing. You know, at the time that I rescued the piano and had it moved, um, I was a drummer. I hadn't branched out to other instruments yet, so it's sort of like, why was I so attached to this piano? And there's a couple reasons. At the time, the piano was extremely important to me because I'm the youngest of three children. And my oldest brother passed away in 1983. I was six years old, he was 10 years old. And he had played on the piano. And it was a chapter in my family's life where it went from really, really bad to then horrifically bad after my brother's death. Um, anytime we my brother came up in the family like there was really no sort of help from my you know other sibling and myself to discuss what happened he he was in as he was a sick child he was asthmatic and one night he um he had a heart condition as well and he he passed away and I, we were we were sharing a bedroom and i remember um him turning blue me getting my father my mother was out of the house that night and i still remember sitting at the top of the steps looking out it was you know a very dark night november and i just remember seeing the ambulance and i never saw my brother again so my attachment to this piano because he played and he had gotten some lessons and i think that despite my parents dysfunction i think that they in those early years when we were small they my i think it was driven by my mother she did try to get things together like get us piano lessons and he, he was the, the one in the family that played the piano. He almost gave the piano a purpose, which was interesting. My mother went through every parent's nightmare, which is to lose a child. And I will never, there are many truths to the story, many truths to our childhood trauma. But anytime the subject of my brother's passing came up, it was all about my mother's grief. Which in some ways, it's like kind of understandable. But to a six-year-old, seeing your mother in that much pain is to, that's the terror that little children kind of, you know, because in many ways around that period, I lost my brother, but then I also lost my mother around that time to grief and alcoholism. And, you know, there was an, you know, whether nuclear family or extended family, no one was asking how the kids were doing. But the another side of the truth was sort of that it was heartbreaking for all of us, but kids need a lot of help around meaning making around why we would lose a sibling or the events that happened in that. And I spent a lot of time in therapy processing all that, thank God. That's really the root of my trauma. There's stuff that happened before, stuff that happened after. So in a summary of my family, it's already a horrifically bad domestic violence marriage. There's already alcoholism in those early years. There's a lot of mismanagement of money and dysfunction. And then my brother passes away in 83. The alcoholism ramps up. My father, a couple years later, is diagnosed with cancer. He has that for 10 years. That's going to be a huge part of the family story. And, you know, because it's like very, very tricky having an abusive person in your life be very, very medically sick. Really messes with you. So... That's the attachment. And then, you know, like my father dying in 95, the house foreclosure in 96, the loss of the piano. So that's really the main reason at the time that I was sort of hell-bent on getting that piano back. And, you know, I'm just, I'm very, very grateful to have done that because it's just, it's, you know, pianos are, <laughs> pianos are easy to give up on. But there was something else in me Aside from that, it was a very important, it was the only connection that I really, really had, would have had to my, my brother who passed away at that time. But then I was thinking of sort of doing this podcast or this story, reflecting back on it is 
my attachment to the piano and being hellbent on getting it back was actually really about the dignity in my family. Because there was just so much mess. There was just so much chaos. Not everyone has a similar childhood trauma story. You could have had a looks good on paper family and everything's tip top and you, there's still abuse in just different ways. But, you know, I came from that really chaotic sort of family. And I think why I was so driven to get that piano back is I think that the piano also represented to me stability or dignity of the family. And I think at the time that I was so triggered around almost losing the piano or my mother's lying to me or, or whatever is, I think we hold on to those objects in a way that, I guess my attitude around at the time was like, you can't take it, everything away from me, directed at my parents. You know what I mean? Like you've just driven this family so far into the ground and we've had so much loss that I'm not going to let you just sort of toss away the one sort of symbol of family life or normalcy or something in that. And that thought didn't really occur to me until later about why I was so driven to that. And coming back to that objects I think have a soul is, you know, for those of you that left under similar circumstances, you know, like I have clients that all they have is their like mother's 1970s plastic spaghetti colander or some little frame or something like that but that's really that's kind of all that's left from that um and you know i'm very very grateful that to have this 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 piano in my life it's got so much soul to it that i I, i'll probably hold on to it (laughs) for the rest of my life or or pass it on to someone else as just a trajectory of i built a life leaving that, thankfully, through recovery and and therapy and sobriety. Also, around that time when I got the piano, I was also struggling with drugs and alcohol. So it was just sort of that, all that going on. And now the piano sits in my living room. And uh, I could get, you know, emotional talking about it. But um, my son now plays the piano. You know, since he was like probably five or six, he's he would put his foot down on the sustain pedal and play in a, in a pentatonic scale and just kind of, it was just the most beautiful thing in my life seeing this little boy playing the piano. And now he plays more. He is a lot like me in the way that he, he doesn't really like lessons. He did take lessons for a while, but it's like, you know, it's kind of like they, they can be a little bit draining and short attention span. So he just goes on YouTube and, and learns how to play visually, which I'm fascinated by that, how everyone's a different learner. And recently my son is now 11. And it really hit me that he's playing the piano. Um, this just happened last year, like sort of like when he, as he's moving from 10 to 11, there's this anniversary for me about how when my brother passed at 10. So it's very powerful to see my 11 year old playing this piano. And what you've been hearing throughout the whole podcast here is little excerpts of him playing the piano. So it's a really a full circle story. And I get just these beautiful moments of just seeing my son play the piano and I just it just makes me so happy and the piano it, it it's actually been tuned up a technician has come out to look at it it still has a lot of longevity into it uh, a couple years ago I was thinking that that wasn't really going to be the case from what another sort of piano tuner told I think that that is another thing to be grateful for is that the <laughs> the actual the piano is actually in tune and getting use so I hope you've enjoyed this story I hope you've gotten something out of it, and I think that the the things that we hold on to is it's not the thing. I think it's the legacy that we're trying to sort of maybe change, or that we're just trying to hold on to a little bit of dignity. And if you if you don't really quite relate to the story, there there's just many people who left their home or catapulted out of their home of origin, like I was. Um, and you don't have to relate to it, but there is kind of a, an orphan quality that happens to individuals when they grow up in houses like this, where, you know, the family is not, it's like they've given up on the idea of being family because they're so self-consumed. So that's the moral to the story. Uh, That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I hope that this has been beneficial. And as always, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. 
May you be peaceful and at ease, and may you be joyous. And I will see you next time. Mm-hmm.